Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Healthy Sex's monthly Sexpert webinar. Uh, today is Friday, July 14th, and I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. Jennifer Weeks. Uh, Dr. Weeks is the founder and director of Sexual Addiction Treatment Services, which is an outpatient program for out-of-control sexual behavior. Uh, Sex Addiction Treatment Services has two locations and seven clinicians who provide individual, couples, and group therapy. Dr. Weeks has over 12 years experience treating addiction, trauma and addiction, sexual addiction, and sexual offenders. She is a certified sex addiction therapist supervisor a certified advanced alcohol and drug counselor, a licensed professional counselor, and a clinical member of ATSA, which is the professional organization for treating sexual offenders. In addition to her traditional clinical work, Dr. Weeks provides pretrial psychosexual evaluations specializing in cybersex offending and is a recognized expert witness in the area of cybersex offending, sexual offenders, and sexual addiction. She's a recognized expert in six Pennsylvania county courts and with the federal government, and has a new book out on how to uh, work with adolescents and teens on their internet sexual uh, habits and uses, which she's gonna tell you more about today. So I'm delighted to have Dr. Weeks here as part of our um, series because we get so many questions about adolescence um, and sexuality and the internet, and um, we still have a lot to learn in that area. So without further ado, I'm going to turn you over to Dr. Jennifer Weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. So um, I'm just going to start this out saying this is my first webinar, and I'm used to doing this in person. Um, and I'm a rather interactive presenter, so those of you that are here um, joining us, um, feel free to use that little chat piece. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, um, you know, throw your questions up into the chat bar, and I will do my best to answer them as best I can. Um, and hopefully I can answer what questions that you have. Um, as Alex said, this is really an area that is um, burgeoning and that we don't have a lot of research, we don't have a lot of data, we're, we're trying to understand um, what the effect on cyber sex is on um, you know, children and adolescents, and that's as, because technology is ever evolving and quickly evolving, um, I think our research and our data is always a little bit behind. Um, so we just do the best we can and, and encourage parents to talk to their children. And hopefully today I can give you, you know, some information on what's uh, what's going on with adolescents, what they're doing, and um, what the effect is on them, on their burgeoning sexuality, as well as maybe some thoughts and, and some insights as to how to talk to your own children about these issues. Um, so I, if you'll indulge me for a minute or two, I just want to kind of give you some background as to why I wrote this book, How to Talk to Your Teen About Cybersex and Pornography in the Digital Age. <clears throat> and it really came about through my clinical work with my adult addicts and offenders that I work with. When we work, um, you know, on sexual histories and we talk about things, I would always ask them, how did you learn about sex? How did you learn about sexuality? And my older clients basically said, well, you know, nobody ever taught them. Uh, maybe mom or dad left a book in a linen closet and hoped they read it. Uh, they learned about sex or sexuality from their peers on the, you know, on the schoolyard. And the longer I've been doing this work, the younger and younger my clients have been getting. So those answers are now, well, I learned about sexuality and sex from pornography. Um, you know, my older clients, obviously, internet pornography didn't exist. And now as my clients are getting, you know, to be teenagers and younger and younger as opposed to, you know, 50-year-old people, um, they're learning about pornography basically um, from internet pornography, which is not necessarily the best sex educator. Um, so my thought was, you know, as opposed to just treating people, it's time maybe we do some prevention work. We do prevention for drug addiction and alcohol addiction and gambling addiction, you know, where's the uh, prevention for pornography. So that's some of uh, just the background. So I'm not sure how this is going to work doing this on the internet because um, I usually do this back and forth. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw some icons up at you 
Um, and if anybody wants to kind of answer in the chat and see if you um, know what these apps are, and it's kind of how I like to start. So I'm going to throw the first one up. And I know there's a bit of a delay. Anybody know what this one is? We're going to start easy. See if anybody's chatting. Yes, Facebook, everybody. This one's an easy one. The next one, we're going to start with the easier ones. Who knows what this one is? Instagram. All right, I've got some savvy people out there. We're going to keep going. This one's pretty common, too. The little ghost is Snapchat. You got it. Absolutely. Okay, what about the little bird? Do we know what the little bird is? Twitter. Yep, okay. You guys are on it. This is good. And do we know what this one is? YouTube. Yep, okay. So we're savvy so far. We're starting with the easier ones. Um, and I'm going to throw a little data in for you before we get rolling. The, this is a very recent survey that just came out about a month ago looking at the impact of five social media sites. And these are pretty much the most common social media sites that um, teenagers, adolescents use in terms of um, positive or, or negative impact. And so YouTube was found to have a positive net impact on teenagers' lives. So looking at that, um, kind of addressing the fact that YouTube can absolutely have negative impact as well as a positive. And YouTube was the only one that's had a, a positive net impact. Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, you know, when they talk to teens, though they're on it all the time and it's a huge part of their social lives, negative impact on their lives. And what we do know is that the two most popular um, social media sites today, and, you know, that changes all the time, um, used by adolescents are Instagram and Snapchat. So I just kind of, those are your most common and wanted to give you a little information. So I'm going to throw some more icons at you and see what you know. All right, anybody know what this one is? WhatsApp, all right. Lauren is on this. Simone, thank you. So WhatsApp is not um, as commonly used in the United States as it is in other countries. It is um, a messaging app. It, uh, you can message, you can do video calls, you can do phone calls. It's used frequently internationally because you can then, you know, communicate internationally um, without fee. So again, the U.S., we don't use this one quite so much, but it is out there. Okay. Anybody know what this one is? This one's kind of a little self-evident. So we've got Kick. And what Kick is is a messaging app again, um, and this is something that we see very commonly used uh, for sexting um, or for um, hookups. So in the addict community, uh, people who struggle with problematic sexual behavior, we see um, you know either like on Craigslist uh, ads or you know in um, apps like Whisper or anonymous apps, people will say, kick me, um, and they'll have a kick ID, and that's a way to sort of connect and message and sext. Um, in, in my world, it's frequently used for sexual purposes. I'm sure there's other people out there who just use kick to, to message innocuously. Um, but again, in my clientele base, this is usually has a sexual base to it. All right. Anyone know what this one is? I'm going to give you guys a second. All right, so this is Ask FM. Again, not as common. And this is a, a site, an anonymous site, where uh, people, anybody can go on, post questions, get answers, chat. Um, I do put some of the anonymous sites up because this is where we can see um, cyberbullying happen. Um, you know, we hear about that in the news, um, you know, cyberbullying on anonymous sites as well as obviously Facebook, Instagram, things like that. All right, who knows the next one? We have a little delay. This one's a little more old school, but it's still out there. People still use it. Tumblr. Yes, thank you, Lauren. Lauren and Simone got, have the tech down. Um, Tumblr, again, you have an account. This is images. Um, this is can be, again, innocuous images, very pretty images of your trip to Europe, 
um, but it also can be very sexual images and there's lots of accounts on Tumblr that are strictly pornographic. Okay. This one is a little newer. It came out last year. Anybody know what this is? Lauren, you're close. So Lauren said Tinder. Um, it is an app called Yellow. And this app came out last year. Um, there was lots of news and hubbub about it because it is aimed at teens. That's the target audience, and it is a friend meeting site. So it is not a hookup site by their definition. It's yellow. It is um, a friend meeting app. But what the news and what people are concerned about is that this app completely mimics Tinder. Yes, swipe. Do you see someone physically that maybe you want to be friends with and hang out with, you swipe. So a lot of the news articles, if you look up information on the app Yellow, we'll call it like Tinder in training. Um, so that's something to be aware of, that the idea is I'm just going to meet new and interesting people that I'm going to hang out with, but is it then a hookup site? Depends on how you use it. All right. Anyone know what this one is? It has a cool icon. All right, so this is After School. This is an anonymous site. After School, it's targeted at school age children. And it's an anonymous sort of venting site where you can vent and um, you know meet people on here from your school or from surrounding schools. Um, the problem that happens very frequently with these anonymous school-based sites is that they become a huge venue for cyberbullying. And I know that our main topic today is about cybersex, but you can't really talk about cybersex without um, talking about cyberbullying because unfortunately they frequently go hand in hand. So this is after school. There was another um, app that about two months ago they actually shut down which was called Yik Yak and that was another one that had a lot of problems with uh, again targeted at uh, children in schools. A lot of problems with that. They um, geocached it so that um, grade school children couldn't use it. And then it became um, kind of like the hookup app for colleges, what my 20-year-olds uh, told me. And that just was shut down um, in May, I do believe, because of all of the problems that they were having with that. All right. Anyone know what this one is? OK, so this is Vent. Uh, we are in the realm of the anonymous app still. Again, this is an anonymous app where you go on and you vent about anything that you want to, um, kind of like the app Whisper. And I show my age when I talk about this because uh, there was an art project called Post Secrets years and years ago where a gentleman had asked people to just write a postcard with whatever their secret was and send it um, to him. And, it, and that you know, people wrote, you know, these amazing secrets that they'd never told anyone to this anonymous stranger. And these, this idea has been adapted to these apps where people will go on, they'll post secrets, they'll whisper is a secret app, um, or they'll go on to apps like this and vent and talk anonymously. And then this is a venue where people, if they like what other people are saying, can ask, um, if you know you want to kick or, or message on WhatsApp or kick or any of the other messaging apps. All right. Anyone know what this little purple guy is? Okay, so this is Meet Me. This is along the same lines as the newer app Yellow. This is a friend finding app. Uh, for teens, for young people, and again, good intentions, you know, help people meet new people and, uh, you know, find folks they might have common interests with. Um, the struggle is always, obviously, can it be used as a hookup app? And then what a lot of people, particularly law enforcement, struggle with is their concern um, that adults who are looking to have sexual interactions with minors, so offenders might get on apps like Meet, um, Meet Me or Yellow and try to connect with teens, uh, you know, for purposes of sexual abuse. So these are always good things to kind of know um, are out there. Again, their intention is good. 
sometimes the way we use them isn't. All right, who knows what this one is? This one's a little more common again. Tinder, yep. So why am I putting Tinder up? We're talking about adolescence. Tinder is an adult dating app, right? Well, there's a lot of teens who are on Tinder. You're supposed to check a box that verifies how old you are. You can do that even if you're not that old. And there are absolutely minors who are on Tinder, um, either hooking up with or other minors, or then you know hook, lying about their age and um, potentially hooking up with adults. So again, if you're a parent and you've got a child, you need to be mindful of these things because these are adult dating apps. And many times the adults on these apps are assuming everyone's an adult. They're not taking IDs when they meet someone for a date. Um, and it could set your child up for a problem. All right, I'm gonna throw two more at you. Anybody know what this one is? Give me a second. Okay. So this is Grinder. This is an uh, a, again an adult app, um, a hookup app uh, targeted at the gay male community. Again, it's adults. You're supposed to be 18 or over in order to use it. There's other apps like this, Jacked, Adam for Adam. There's a list. I could kind of go through them all, but I bring them to people's attention again because I absolutely know that there are minors that go on these apps. Um, not necessarily honest about their age, and then um, are either going out and having interactions with adult men. I've had adult male clients who've been arrested for meeting minors on uh, this or similar sites. So things we need to be mindful of is that when your child is on any of these apps, there's no way that the people who um, run the apps, know how old the person is who's using it. Um, you know, there's no way to really monitor all of that. So there's some potential dangers up here um, for inappropriate sexual contact. Um, if you're not really sure what your child is doing, you know, what sites they're using, what apps they're using. Um, and so I'm gonna throw one more at you and see if anybody knows this one. Okay, so this is Uvu, which is just an example. Again, it's not as commonly used anymore, but it is still used by some folks. Uh, an example of the genre of video chat. Um, so people still do video chat. Uvu is one of them. Um, you know, and there's all kinds of ways that we can use video chat, right? We can do that um, in a really appropriate way and video chat with our, you know, best friend who now lives in, um, Arkansas, or we can use it in an inappropriate way. So some things that I don't have on here for icons that we should probably talk about um, are apps that hide apps. So if you're a tech savvy and aware parent, you go on, on your child's phone and you're like, okay, maybe we shouldn't have this app or, you know, what are you doing, you know, on kick? Let me look at what you're looking at on YouTube. But for, you know, there's always a way around. So there are absolutely apps, Calculator is one of them, whose specific and entire intent is to hide the apps they have on the phone from someone else's view. So pretty, you know, if your child is using one of these apps, there's really no way you're gonna know because you'll pick up their phone and you'll swipe through and you'll be like, oh, okay, nothing here looks inappropriate. And maybe there are some things on there that, that shouldn't be or that we should be monitoring, but you can't see them because they're using one of these apps that will hide the other apps. So um, there's always something changing. And so my proviso with this list of um, sort of icons for apps that I give you is that this is today and I'm sure it's probably already a little out of date and tomorrow there will be something else. So this is a completely ever changing landscape. What is popular changes all the time. Uh, Facebook used to be the most popular, uh, you know, social media site with teens. Well, what happened to that? We got on Facebook. And so it became really uncool to be on Facebook when your parents or your grandparents are on Facebook. So things change. Um, so Ophelia has just uh, texted me a message. It says, um, 
do you encourage parents to go through their children's social media messages? And if you will, I want to ask you to kind of table that because we will talk a little bit later about, you know, whether we filter, whether we don't filter and, and what we do with those things. So I have your question in my mind and hopefully we will address that. Okay, so playing with apps is, is done for the moment. Um, I want to start us next into talking about sexting. Um, because I do work a lot in the legal field, I'm uh, paying attention to this and I see this all the time. Um, big news this week in that arena is that um, in the United Kingdom, one of the um, police districts, and I don't remember which one, you know, sort of had was talking about their statistics of how many young people um, they're getting calls about who are sexting and that their youngest person who has been referred to them for a criminal complaint around sexting was five years old. So I talk about this in terms of teens or adolescents, and sometimes that's too late. So, you know, to think about a five-year-old sexting to me is a bit mind-boggling, but it's out there. So, you know, I, I, I don't think we can ignore these things, even if it's uncomfortable. How we see, um, how we hear about texting with teens frequently tends to be some kind of scandal that goes through a school where somebody's caught sexting or um, a naked image of a student goes kind of flying through the whole student body. Um, so these things come up a lot. So let's talk about sexting. Why on earth do we sext? Um, you know, to someone who's not a digital native, that's me, I'm a digital immigrant, we folded notes into little footballs and passed them a couple seats down and tried not to get caught. Um, it doesn't seem like a natural thing to do, but for digital natives, these kids who grew up with a phone in their hand or with a tablet in their hand, this is a normal, they text, so sexting becomes this extension of that. Um, and so sexting can be um, either just verbiage, so sexual chat. Um, it can be sending sexual photos or sexual um, videos now. Basically, any way we have to send data. Okay. So, yes, children sext. And again, our research literature is a little behind um, what happens because that's how the academia works. But if you read the newspapers, you would probably think that every single child out there is sexting all the time. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, most Western countries, European countries, you're looking at, you know, one to five percent, one to four percent of girls and boys. Um, a more recent literature review, so that's a study that looks at a whole bunch of studies and pulls the data together. Um, shows us that about 10% of adolescents have sent a message with sexual content, 15.6% have received it. Um, another study looks, gave us numbers that 35% had received sex. So a uh, couple questions come up is that, you know, why might more people be receiving them than sending them? And I think that that goes when um, a mass video goes around. So maybe one person sends an image or a video to 10 or 12 people. So we have less senders than we do receivers. Um, and what the data tells us is it's also very variable, that it's not uncommon for kids to sex, but it's not um, epidemic like sometimes the news might, might want you to see. Um, and if you look at how many adults are sexting, a lot more adults are sexting than our adolescents. So uh, this becomes really confusing, I think, for kids, because if I'm 17 or, you know, I'm 18, under the age of 18, this is really inappropriate and I shouldn't be doing it and maybe I can get arrested for child pornography charges. But then when I turn 18, I go from getting messages, you know, that we shouldn't be doing this and that it's bad to, you know, Glamour and Cosmo articles about how to send the best sex. So not only do we not talk about things, but we give kids mixed messages as well, which I think is, is problematic and really confusing. Okay. So why do children sex? Um, I think there's a lot of different reasons um, to get attention, right? What what do we want in, in terms of romance and, and that... Um, 
learning our sexuality and learning about who we are as a, a young man or a young woman and in our romantic interactions, we want attention. It feels good to have somebody notice us and, and find us attractive. Um, sexting also has really become just an extension of experimentation with sexuality. Um, as long as there have been adolescents, there has been experimentation with sexuality. What has changed is just the means and how technology has really um, kind of taken that to a new level and sometimes a very public level where again younger generations we didn't have to deal with this um, sexting can be for flirtation so in a relationship if I'm in a committed relationship with another teen maybe that's part of how we flirt maybe that's part of our courtship um, you know but that again there's a um, implication that that's an uh, sexting between two people and it's not going to be shared. What we do um, know from the data about younger children um, is that sometimes they'll send these images kind of as a joke, not understanding, um, you know, really the context or the possible outcomes of uh, results of sending those images, but as opposed to you know, really trying to get the attention of a boy or a girl, it could be just, haha, look at this, isn't it funny? So there's lots of reasons um, why kids do sex. And I think um, we have to look at it as adults, as parents, as a piece of um, sexual experimentation and uh, expression of sexuality and talk about it more in those terms than, you know, it's illegal, you can't do it, it's bad. If we kind of put shame on these behaviors, we tend to put them into, into the secret zone versus really talking to children about, you know, how nice it feels to have somebody be interested in you, to, to want to be with you, to want to go on a date with you, but what are, you know, more appropriate or healthier ways to gain someone's attention than to be sending sexual images or to be asking for sexual images. Okay. I think I have another question coming at me somewhere. Charlie, I don't see that. If you can send it to me, I'll try to get her question. Okay, here we go. Oh, okay, so Karen, I'm going to read this since I'm the only one who can see it. Um, asked how we know or how do parents find out um, about the apps that hide? So um, in terms of just learning all of the names of them or what they are, your best bet is to maybe just Google, you know, apps that hide. I tend to get my information um, obviously from teenagers, but also ironically from the Wall Street Journal frequently because technology is about money as well. Um, so you get a lot of data about what new apps are and what's out there. Um, but unfortunately, unless you're a super tech savvy um, parent, you're not going to know that one of those apps is on there. The best option when you have younger children um, is to, you know, from the get-go when a child gets a smartphone, um, you know, maybe disable their ability to download apps without parental permission. So they can't just download something and anytime they want to download an app, you have to put in a password um, so that you know what apps they are downloading. And when your child wants to download a new app, you can have a discussion about it versus if you don't have that bit of parental control on there, your child can just download anything. Um, so Karen, I hope that answers your question at least a little bit. Okay. Um, so want to talk a little bit to, to jump back on track about sexting and risk because there's an assumption I think frequently that people who are kids who sext a lot are engaging in riskier behaviors and what the data is showing us is a lot of that uh, assumption is bearing fruit. Middle school students who sext um, do express higher intentions to engage in sexual activity. So if they're sexting, they're more likely to be engaging in sexual contact with another person. Uh, people who sext frequently are more likely to have unprotected sex. So we're more likely to have um, sex with another person and not think about STIs or our own health. They're more likely to have multiple partners. Girls who frequently sext um, are more likely to have used drugs or alcohol in conjunction with sex. I um, mean, absolutely, people who sext are very likely to be the uh, victim of bullying and the cyberbullying. Okay, sexting is also associated with the need to be popular. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. Okay, all right. 
So I have a question that I'm going to actually um, hold until we talk about pornography um, because um, it's talking about sort of wiring in terms of pornography, and I'm going to hold that question. So, um, Ethley, I want you to know I hear you, and I will get there. Okay. Predictors of sexting, uh, kids who are more likely to sext pay for their own phone. So there's that philosophy, I pay for it, it's mine, I can do what I want with it. Um, parents who do not ever monitor activity, their kids are more likely to sext. Um, older kids are more likely to sext. And your kids that are um, sensation seekers, they're more likely to sext. So those are the few predictors that we have. We don't have good, hard, and fast predictors of that. And so we know what we think about sexting. I mean, and as adults, I don't think we're really big fans of kids sexting, but what do the kids think? Um, and I think one of the big arguments a lot of adults try to make is don't do it, it's illegal, you'll get in big trouble. Well, kids know it's illegal. They just don't care. Um, you know, they don't really think about it. They know it's illegal, they'll still do it. Um, so using that argument of it's illegal, you're getting get in trouble is not something that's gonna work with kids when we talk to them about sexting. Um, they think it's no big deal, and they think it's part of courtship. Um, and again, I think this also depends on age. So a, a friend of mine, her daughter, I think her daughter was in fifth grade at the beginning of the school year last year, got on the school bus, her sixth grade friend took a picture of her breasts, sent it to a boy. The sixth grade friend engaged in the behavior, didn't think it was a big deal. My friend's fourth grade daughter did. Um, so age sometimes has plays into it as well as how much the parents have talked to them. So, but fundamentally, a lot of kids just don't think this is a big deal and we make a bigger stink about it than it is. What I do want to talk about with sexting um, before we start talking about pornography is the difference with gender um, because there is absolutely a gender difference. Um, girls who sext report that they get a lot of pressure from boys to send images, to send sexual images. When they do it, they are judged, they are, you know, sluts, they are called all of these horrible names. Um, if they send the sex, if they don't, they're also judged. So then they're a prude or whatever other, you know, kind of demeaning names that want to get called. And they're not just judged harshly by boys, they're judged very harshly by other girls. Boys, on the other hand, don't really face that double-edged sword. If they can get a girl to send them a sexual image, it's sort of like this affirmation of prowess and a, a good thing for their reputation. So it's a double-edged sword for girls. They're pressured and they're judged. They're judged if they do, they're judged if they don't. Um, so this is something when you're talking to, particularly if you have a daughter, about this, that this is a, a big social issue too and this is a big peer pressure issue too. And how do they deal with that? When we're talking about sexting, we also absolutely have to talk about the difference between consensual and non-consensual. Um, consensual sexting, obviously, between two people in a relationship, there is an expectation of privacy and that image will not be shared. Non-consensual sexting is what usually makes the newspapers, if you see an article about it. Um, that's a sex that gets distributed without the person permission of the original sender. Revenge sex. You hear about revenge porn. So this very frequently happens if a relationship ends, if it ends badly. I sent you this image because we're in a relationship. I'm assuming you're not going to send it to anyone. We break up. Boom, you send it to, you know, all of your friends on the baseball team or something like that. Um, Every state has different laws about teen sexting. Some have none, but sometimes they do differentiate between consensual and non-consensual sexting. If it's non-consensual, that's not okay. And, and most states who have laws about this have laws against non-consensual sexting. Um, I'm gonna fly by this because I'm in Pennsylvania, so we talk sometimes about Pennsylvania law. My very brief researching about California law is that California doesn't yet have a sexting law on the books, but don't quote me. Um, there is a cyberbullying law that was proposed, what I read last year, um, but hasn't gone through. So, um, again, looking at cyberbullying, we have to look at cyberbullying if we're looking at sexting or online pornography. If I'm posting even a sexy image of myself on Facebook, Instagram, or Snapchat, I am putting myself out there. I want likes, I want attention, 
but I'm also open to really horrible, nasty, hurtful uh, responses from other people. And many teens, many, many teens, um, this 2014 data I think is low. Um, if you talk to teachers, if you talk to parents, many teens are experiencing cyber harassment. So I think if you're talking about cyber sex, sexting, pornography, you have to talk about cyber bullying because there's a huge vulnerability there. So any quick questions about sexting before we move on to pornography? Let's see if there's anything in the chat. And that's a no. OK, so let's talk about porn. Um, teens and online pornography. And this is where I'm going to get to the question about um, the wiring. So a lot more teens are looking at online pornography than they used to. In 2005, the data said, you know, 8% of 12 to 17 year olds, 25% uh, reported unwanted exposure. 10 years later, almost 50% of boys are intentionally visiting explicit websites, and many of them are visiting that regularly. Um, so before we get into that, I do want to address the question about sort of development. Um, a sexual development and arousal templates. So today's porn is not the porn of pre-internet. Um, that really looks rather vanilla by today's definition. So what kids are exposed to today, and your average age of first exposure is about you know nine or ten years old for a child. Again, not necessarily intentional. Um, Back in the pre-internet days, maybe you were exposed to a pornography, uh, a Playboy magazine, maybe a penthouse. It was a still image. It probably wasn't hardcore sex. Today's exposure, your first exposure as a nine-year-old, boy or girl, could be to rape pornography. It could be to bestiality. It could be to um, things that their body is going to have a biological response to and their brain will not understand what it means. Um, they call today's pornography gonzo porn. Um, and there's a really great pornography education curriculum out of Australia that actually interviewed the actors, uh, many of the actors in pornography, who are themselves distressed by what they call gonzo porn, which because it's so much more um, aggressive, violent, so much more, um, I would say, aggressive towards women for heterosexual pornography. So your teen's exposure to online pornography could be something that absolutely um, has the potential to change their wiring. Again, the data on that, the science on that isn't you know, real solid. We don't have tons of data on that. That's coming. But what we always say, you know, about addiction and the brain is that what fires together wires together. So if I'm first exposed to very violent pornography and I watch it over and over and over again and maybe I masturbate to it and I have an orgasm, that's a big dopamine hit. That's a big reward. I'm going to be patterning my arousal to something that is more violent. Um, or maybe I'm patterning my arousal to basically internet. There's a um, large number of young men, 20, early 20s, um, who have what they call um, pornography-induced uh, erectile dysfunction. So they've spent so much time looking at internet pornography that they have a hard time having a productive erection with a live human being when they go to have a sexual encounter with them. And it really is because they're wired to instant click, 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 fast paced um, things that keep their interest and no static human being can be as you know quick paced and interesting as the internet so you know there's a lot of of concern about children's exposure to pornography does it wire them for connection does it wire them for, for performance-based sexuality does it wire them to even be sexual with another human being um, you know so we have some thoughts about this we have some data um, we don't have a ton um, so to answer the question um, that Esli posed, are we creating a generation hardwired to addiction? Um, my thought is that there's a serious potential for that. So I don't know that everyone who ends up that way uh, will be hardwired for addiction, but we're going to talk in a second about frequent versus infrequent users. So, um, and I'm running a little short on time, so I'm going to run through some of this. Um, 
because I, there is a difference between people who look at uh, pornography, even teens, every now and then versus frequent users. And so I think that's where we run into the differences between am I patterning my arousal to maybe violent things or in this addictive fashion or not. Um, teens seek pornography by accident, they're curious. Um, for a lot of teens, it's sexual education. If no one has ever talked to me about sex and sexuality, um, or I have a sexuality um, that's not acceptable in my family, perhaps I'm a you know, gay teen or a lesbian or bisexual and nobody in my family is willing to talk to me about that, maybe I go to the internet and to pornography to learn about that. I'm not a big fan of sex ed by porn. Um, it's not teaching about um, you know, disease prevention. It's not teaching about relationships. It's not teaching um, about what real life sex actually looks like. It's this very performance based modality. So I do want to talk about the difference between frequent and non-frequent users because our problems tend to come with teens and adolescents that are frequent pornography users. They think about sex more often, much more permissive attitudes about uh, sex, and they uh, view women as sex objects more frequently. And the interesting thing with that is that it's not just uh, boys, frequent users of pornography who objectify women more, females, girls who are frequent users of pornography also objectify women more. Frequent users of pornography have sex at an earlier age and are more um, accepting of traditional gender roles. Again, a lot of this data is around heterosexual teens, so a woman in a submissive role. Uh, frequent users of pornography. Um, what is frequent? I guess I should address that as well. When we look at data, it changes because every study defines frequent very differently, um, but we're not talking about somebody who maybe, you know, a couple times a month or maybe, you know, for 20 minutes once a week is looking at pornography. Um, we're talking about people who are looking at it greater frequency, longer periods of time. Um, in a Swedish study a few years ago, they defined high consumers or people who watched from every week up to every day. Most of this is on the mobile phone. Um, and these teens who were frequent users had problems with their psychosocial health or health. So um, school, family relationships, social relationships. Um, again, what the data is showing us um, that frequent users of pornography want to try what they've seen in the pornography with their sexual partner that they have. Um, which again becomes problematic when if we're depending on the type of pornography we're looking at, if we're exposed to and, um, you know, seeing lots of pornography about, um, you know, more violent sexual practices, we might just assume that, well, the women in pornography like this, so maybe my partner is going to like it and I'll try to engage in these things without having conversations with my partner. Um, frequent users of pornography, again, are using more drugs and alcohol like your sexters. Um, and what is a, a struggle for me as someone who uses um, or who works with sexual offenders is that frequent users of pornography will also um, engage in sexually coercive behaviors, according to this study, three times more often than non-frequent users. So coercion is not consent. Um, so our is pornography, you know, influencing some teens to engage in coercive sexual practices? And for me, that's just not okay. Um, I'm hoping everybody agrees with me on that one. Um, there's other impacts of pornography. So there's a huge impact of pornography um, on the self-esteem of the child or the teen who's watching it. Body image issues come up um, all the time. Most of us do not look like, uh, you know, the actors in a pornography uh, pornography video. They are um, frequently enhanced. Um, we don't perform the same way that the actors in those those videos perform as well. They have fluffers. There's takes. But if I'm a, you know, a, a young adolescent and this is what sex is to me because this is all I've learned, I'm going to assume that porn sex is real sex. And so when I get in that situation with a partner, you know, maybe I'm going to feel not good enough. Maybe I'm going to feel like my penis isn't big enough. Maybe I'm going to think that if I don't engage in, you know, this hour long sexual marathon, I'm a, a poor sexual partner. So self-esteem takes a huge hit because, again, 
porn isn't reality. And if my view of sex and sexuality is porn, I'm either going to be disappointed by reality in terms of not being able to be aroused by it, or maybe I'm going to be disappointed by my partner or my own performance in reality, because it's just not the same. Okay, so porn addiction. Um, some people will say pornography addiction isn't real. Some people will say that it is. Um, obviously, I treat sexual addiction or problematic sexual behavior, so I do believe that pornogra uh, pornography addiction is a real valid thing. Um, and we do see it with teens. Again, when I started, my average client age was about 55 years old. Now we're getting referrals for children as young as 11 who are using pornography in a compulsive fashion. They are watching it all the time. Um, you know, their quality of life is diminished because of their compulsive use of pornography. But if we're looking at, is my child's pornography use addictive, I want you to know it's not just about the behavior. If they're looking at porn, it doesn't mean they're an addict. If they're looking at it with some frequency, it doesn't necessarily mean they're an addict. We have to kind of look around at their relationship with it and their behavior around it. Is there lots of secrecy? You know, is there a lot of isolation? Are they staying up um, all night online? Are they, um, you know, losing social connections? Are they doing poorly in school? Are they giving up sports? Um, another thing you see very frequently, and this isn't just necessarily indi um, an indication of maybe a pornography addiction, but just a tech addiction in general is can they give up or decrease their tech time? Um, and what I see with a lot of young people um, is that there's a, they spend enormous amounts of time gaming um, and then with the gaming also goes pornography. So they're not just gaming, they're looking at porn or they're not just looking at porn, they're also gaming and spending 8, 10, 12 hours a day outside of school online doing something with technology. So if you suspect that your child has a be uh, some kind of problem with pornography, really look at everything around it. And when you know talk to them, it's not just are you looking at porn, it's a problem, but what's their relationship to it? Why are they looking at it? Um, is it disrupting their, you know, their social life, their school life? In terms of addiction, obviously, if it's a family, it's a something you don't want them to do, or a family value or religious value, we discuss that with them as well. Okay, trying to be mindful of time, guys. So, what do you guys do? Um, what I would love every parent to do um, is to talk about sex and sexuality. But with yourself first, if you're in a committed relationship with your partner first, what are your own values about sex and sexuality? I think that so many parents do not talk to their children about sex because they're uncomfortable talking about it themselves. There's a study that came out a couple years ago in the United Kingdom that parents were literally getting in physical fights with each other over who was going to talk to the kid about sex. Like, we shouldn't be that uncomfortable. So before you talk to your child about sex or sexuality, you need to know your own stuff. What am I uncomfortable about? Do I need more education on anatomy? Do I need more education on, you know, STIs? Do I have any shame about sexuality myself that I need to deal with so I don't pass that on to my child? What we know in the the you know, teen sexuality or the sex addiction field is that when you combine sex and shame, it's a recipe for secrets. Secrets around sexuality is a recipe for, for problems. So what's your stuff as a parent? And I always challenge any parent that I work with, what's your stuff? Let's deal with your stuff first, and then we can talk to the child in a way that doesn't have as much baggage with it. Um, so what sex educators tell us is that kids need to know about sex before sex education starts in school. You need to talk to your kids before the age of 10. And you don't, you know, just dump it all on them at one time. It's little talks, little bits of information, little tidbits, little sound bites. Um, with, you know, middle schoolers, older kids, a lot of times we'll use news reports or things people see online um, as a means to start a conversation. Um, another resource I think that is fabulous for parents um, I think it's from Educate and Empower Kids. They have a series of books called uh, 30 
30 days of sex talks. And it's not just about sex and sexuality. It's about intimacy and relationships and um, consent. So those are good resources to have talks with your kids. But you want their information to come from you because you know the source. By the time your child's in middle school, they should know everything about sex and sexuality. They should know about intimacy. They should know about relationships. And we have to be talking to them about technology. In the United States, um, not every uh, you know, state requires kids to get sexual education. And not every state actually requires school-based sexual education to be accurate. So even if they're getting sex education in school, it might not be right. And most sex education programs do not talk about digital sexuality. Um, some are starting to, but they, we need to know about biology. We need to know about relationships. We need to know about intimacy. And we need to know about tech as well. OK. Um, another great uh, discussion we always have is to filter um, or not to filter. And this is a challenge because what we want to do is decrease risk of exposure, but we also want to teach children resilience. So young kids, we block. Um, the general sort of guideline is until about seventh grade-ish, we filter, we block, search terms, we don't let access to pornography, um, things like that. As your child gets older, you continue to have discussions with them. We can unblock certain things but continue to monitor i'm a big fan of transparency so if i say hey can i see your phone you should be able to say yes but i'll respect your boundaries we need to teach kids resilience because what we've found is that if you just block then um a they'll find a way around it if there's a block and and somebody wants to get to pornography they're gonna find a way around it but the other piece is, is they don't learn impulse control and they don't learn to self-regulate. So young kids, we block, we filter. As they get older, we can monitor. And most of the, you know, the filtering softwares, the net nannies or those covenant eyes types of things give you options if you don't want to filter that you monitor. So you get reports of what websites they're going to or things like that. So we, as they get older, give them a little more autonomy to try to teach them resilience but you're still the parent who's monitoring and you're talking about this all the time. And this really comes from the TOS model. And this is um, research that came out of Penn State where we want to do two things. We want parental control. We want to monitor in a more passive fashion as your teen gets older. We absolutely want to put limits and rules on what you're allowed to do online. Um, you know, that's limits and rules around how much time you're spent, uh, allowed to spend online. What social media apps you're allowed to use. These are parental discussions. Um, and active mediation and the active pieces, we're talking about that. We want to teach teen self-regulation, so awareness. We need to teach them impulse control, and they need to learn to manage negative events that might happen. So I have a question just pop up um, is to from Layla. Is the idea that the kid knows they're being monitored as they're older? Absolutely. This is about open communication and honesty. So all of these discussions or, um, you know, technology plans as a family are discussed. So, you know, when they're young, we're, you know, we're, this is what we're doing. We're blocking these things. You can't do that. As they get older, it's discussions about um, also the meaning, you know, of technology in your teen's life or social media, how they're going to manage that, talking about strategies to manage. Um, and to be honest that, you know, we are going to monitor. That's going to go through there. The secrets, um, you know, I don't like... Um, Personally, this is just my opinion. I don't like not telling teens that they're being monitored because that ends up in gotcha moments and shame. And I, I've just tried to keep shame away from sexuality as much as I possibly can because that can foster problems down the road. This needs to be a dialogue between parents and their children from the get go. Discussions about sex and sexuality with your child as they get older are going to include digital technology? What is online pornography? Um, you know, are they going to be exposed to it? This is, you know, we don't want you to see this. This is why at this age, this is how we're going to prevent it and, and move forward as they show that they have some self-monitoring ability, impulse control, um, and are becoming more adults. So I have another question. I think that's popping up here. 
All right, maybe. Okay, parent describe it. Okay, so wait, I have a um, somebody who just popped in and said that a parent described monitoring in a session this morning and it was good to hear. Monitoring is different than restricting, and I guess I'm being a bit redundant here um, because you think about, you know, back when you were a kid and somebody said, don't do that. What did you do? Well, you know, we're kids. We're impulsive. We, or we, wanna have, we have authority issues. We do what we're told not to do, whereas if we're open and discussing things, it, it's not a big deal. If I can come to my parents and say, hey, so-and-so just sent me this image and I don't know what to do with it, or I saw so-and-so, my, you know, my friend April take a picture of her boobs and it made me really uncomfortable, how do I handle that? The, your child will be comfortable to come talk to you about that because you've made sex and sexuality a safe thing to talk about. It's not shameful, it's not secret, but it's something that we just as, as a healthy family with healthy communication can talk about. Um, and so I'm trying to be mindful of my time here um, and give you some resources. So the 30 days of sex talks, um, those are, like I said, fabulous. And um, somebody posted the educateempowerkids.org is the website where you can get those books. Um, they start for very little kids. So five, I think five to seven is the youngest age group, all the way up through teens. Um, the Family Online Safety Institute is another exceptional um, website to go to for information. It also has things on there like uh, contracts. Um, you know, what is the family policy to help you formulate a family policy around technology and, you know, contracts with your kids about how we're going to use tech, um, what monitoring is going to be like. Again, everything open, structured, transparent. Um, in the picture is um, a movie and a curriculum for teens about pornography. It is from Australia, so it's not as easy to get here, but this is a wonderful program and particularly if anyone is an educator, um, you know, a school-based educator or church-based educator, this uh, curriculum really helps kids think about digital tech, digital sexuality, pornography, sexting, and helps them understand reality from fantasy around those things. Um, so I'm going to also give you my resources. Uh, oh, can we take a few extra minutes for questions? Absolutely. I'm good. The resources are up there. So if we have questions, I'm happy to do my best to answer them. So does anyone have any questions of things I haven't covered? This is a really huge topic, and I usually do these, these kind of lectures in much more detail for a greater length of time, but um, so we're kind of crunching things. Okay, so Lynn wants to know, should parents avoid getting smartphones for their kids? So I'm going to say that's going to be age dependent, right? Um, I, you know, I'll see parents at a restaurant hand their iPad to their two-year-old to keep them quiet. That kind of makes me crazy. Um, I think as they get older, um, you know, smartphones are not necessarily a bad thing. Again, if we've got communication, we've got monitoring or blocking age dependent and discussion with the parents. The thing that we can't do in today's day and age because it makes a child become a social pariah um, is really say, hey, you can't be on any social media at all. Um, it's so ingrained in the social context and the social fabric um, of their lives that to get tell somebody they can't, you know, like a 16 year old to say you can't be on any social media is kind of like social death, which doesn't work very well. Little kids, I don't think they need smartphones at all. Younger kids, middle schoolers, why do they need a smartphone? Okay, Karen asks, the role and technique, technique uh, excuse me, um, for treatment providers. So obviously that's kind of a broad question, depends on what the issue is. I see a number of roles for treatment providers. I think at some level, um, you know, treatment providers can help with teaching healthy sexuality. Um, treatment providers can help with tech addictions or pornography addictions. Um, you know, how do we uh, working with families. A lot of times what we do um, 
with uh, parents is educate them as well. A lot of parents will be very fearful the child has a problem and will educate around what is problematic, what's not. And, and then Karen asks, mistakes to avoid which may exacerbate the problem. Please don't freak out. That's the thing that, that exacerbates the problem. Um, one of the things I think very frequently, like when I talk to my clients about what happened if mom caught you masturbating or what happened if somebody saw you were looking at pornography, when a parent freaks out, we've just introduced shame, right? We've introduced shame about sexuality, about their behavior. Um, and um, now they're not going to tell you anything and it's going to be a shameful thing and hard to talk about. So it's, you know, you walk in, you see pornography on the, the phone or you see your child masturbating. It's sort of, okay, shut the door, take a breath, knock and say, hey, come on, we're going to have a conversation about this. Um, I think that's really in my brain the biggest mistake a parent can make is to shame someone um, or to freak out or get really, really punitive about what's going on. Obviously, some things require, you know, um, consequences. That's just reality. Structure and consequences are reality, but that freaking out is just inducing shame. Okay, so I have another question from Brian. Rec um, recommendations for teens who've sexually offended about electronics. Um, facilitating adolescent offenders in Virginia. Hi, Brian. Yay for offender treatment providers. Um, this is actually an interesting um, conversation to have, um, and I recently watched a webinar with one of the, um, you know, sort of kind of very nationally renowned treatment providers for adolescents. Um, and he talked about towards the end of uh, supervision or probation, gradually reintroducing the teens he works with into pornography uh, to use pornography in a healthy fashion, which is a hugely controversial topic. Um, you know, my adults aren't allowed to use um, electronics very frequently or they have to be monitored. So, I mean, for adolescents, for teens who sexually offend, I mean, I think if you have monitored electronics, that's probably, or monitored internet use, that's probably not a bad idea. Um, but that conversation gets into, you know, probation requirements, rules and regs that are different in every state. Um, but once you've got a teen who's done with whatever their um, requirements are, they're back out into the world. Um, and so they need to learn healthy sexuality. They need to learn um, how to use technology in a healthy fashion, um, you know, and how to engage with sexuality in a way that's not problematic for them. And that probably didn't even remotely answer your question, but it's a very good one. Okay, so I have a question from Simone. How do you provide an atmosphere where speaking openly about sexuality is okay um, without seeming like you're okay with them engaging in sexual acts? Um, I think one of the things that we just need to do when we're talking to kids about sex and sexuality is just acknowledge it's uncomfortable, right? It's uncomfortable for them. They don't want to talk to mom about porn or masturbation, and it's uncomfortable for you. So if we acknowledge that it's uncomfortable, but we're going to talk about it, um, that's sort of a nice way to sort of be honest about yourself and your own feelings and set that stage. Um, and I think, Again, in just the vein of being open and honest, you can talk about, you know, hey, I understand that, you know, sexting is something that kids do. And, you know, have you ever done it? Have you been tempted? You know, have your friends done it? What do you what do you think about it? What are your feelings about sexting? And, you know, this is where our family stands on this as your parent. You know, this is not something I'm, I want to allow in my household or this is how we feel about it. You know, and these are the rules of our family. So you can absolutely talk to them um, openly and honestly and being understanding of what those behaviors mean in their social context or in their lives, finding out why they engage if they are, but still setting limits and boundaries, right? Because that's the job of a parent, limits, boundaries, structure. Um, so yeah, people are doing it and maybe it's about exploring sexuality. If you have questions, let's find another way to get them answered. I hope that answers some of your questions. All right, Carolyn says, seems like big picture is talking with kids, especially teens, about trust. Girls sending naked photos with blind trust and boyfriend, but it's risky. Talk with kids about trust, how to trust themselves and others. So, Carolyn, I love this because inherent in healthy sexuality are dis discussions, are discussions about consent, 
right? Um, what is consent? And when we're sending digital imagery, we lose control of that picture. Um, you know, so if I'm consenting to this, I'm doing that with the knowledge um, that I have no control over this image after it leaves my phone. Um, talking about trust is a big piece about talking about emotional intimacy and relationships and connections. Um, and that, you know, when we do these things, when we do trust, being vulnerable in a relationship inherently means that we are putting ourselves at risk of being hurt. Um, and when we're combining that risk with sexual imagery, we are making ourselves vulnerable to that. But I think that trust conversations go hand in hand because in my brain, discussions about sex and sexuality aren't just about reproduction and biology and sex acts and pornography. It's also about consent and intimacy and connection um, and the other pieces that go into healthy sexuality, sensuality. These are things that go into healthy sexuality discussions that aren't just about the physical act of sex. All right, any other questions? Okay, so I think this is the point where I say thank you all very, 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 very much um, for joining me for a very brief discussion of a very huge topic. Um, oh, and I have one more question coming up, so hold on, don't go anywhere. There's one about to pop up. Oh, it's a thank you from Sharon. Thank you, Sharon, you're welcome. Um, if you want more information, you can check out um, my book, The New Age of Sex Education. It is available on Amazon. Um, Dr. Jan's Recovery Readings is a blog where I talk about a lot of the latest research. Check out these websites, check out sex ed websites, and just the biggest message that I want you all to do to get today is talk to your kids. Hi, Hillary. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>